All right, hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in once again to the Black Box Podcast, BBOR, Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia. So, the presidential election is getting a little bit messy, and one of the things that we need to always remember is, this might be one of the things that is on the focus of everybody in America right now. A lot of the political discussion shows, but even just the news in general, maybe some of the things that you're following on Twitter and Instagram, and perhaps even Facebook, we're often talking about the presidential election, but it's not the only issue. However, in back in uh, 2018, I kind of just sort of had the type of realization that everything in life is interlocking, where you sort of see that there is a major world issue. It's not necessarily connected to everything directly, like the way that maybe a conspiracy theorist would draw the lines between two th- issues and the connection isn't real, but interlocking in the sense that it can slowly be connected to other issues over time, especially something like who is going to be president of the United States. And one of the things that is just so pressing with the 2020 general election, the Democratic primaries of 2019, is the amount of people that are in the race. Why are they in the race? They're using this as a publicity stunt. It has really turned into a circus. It's turned almost into like a Price is Right showcase or something, and these are just the people who are showing off, oh, well, I made my own showcase, and I want to be on the show next year or something like that. I mean, like a fan competition or something like that. A little bit crazy, to be honest. It's, it actually is somewhat crazy to say that you can use something like running for president as a way to just kind of promote your own career, your own ambitions, or just for name recognition. I've become somewhat a fan of the libertarian Daryl W. Perry, who ran for president back in 2015 and 2016. And what he was saying was, people will take your ideas seriously if you're running for office. That was his sole ambition. Of course, you know, someone... Not only, we're talking about the libertarian primaries. Not only is the ambition not to win the presidency, it's not even to really win the nomination. Enormous long shot. So it's like, why would you do that in the first place? Well, people will take your ideas seriously if you are running for office. And, you know, like, when you're just someone who just wants to be like, hey, here's a plan for world peace. And if you're going to put stuff out there online, you're going to get, like, zero views. Zero zilch nada. I mean, it's going to be like, people just aren't going to hear about some type of plan from an unknown. So I completely can follow about why someone wants to build up name recognition on the sort of lower levels, like the third parties, the libertarians, and the greens, once again, in the primary stages. Um, Back in 2015 and 2016... The Libertarian and the Green Party both went the same way that they did in 2012. They had the same nom- nominees, Jill Stein for the Green Party and Gary Johnson, of course, for the Libertarians. So the thing is, they got blown out of the water by the more famous establishment candidates of those parties. And those two, uh, the Libertarians and the Greens, just need to absolutely move on. Uh, Gary Johnson was the Libertarian nominee for the Senate in 2018 during the midterms to try and... Uh, I, once again, you really got to want to know, a libertarian, is he even trying to win the Senate nomination, or is he just promoting promoting himself and some of the ideas that he has to say? It's difficult to know with the Libertarian Party. With the Greens, we can definitely say that they aren't anywhere close to actually winning something. And a lot of people who are on the progressive side are just so frustrated with the Green Party and their inability to mobilize, their inability to unify around certain issues. They just don't believe that the Green Party is going to turn into anything that is going to be moving in a forward direction. In short, they believe that the Green Party is just going to fragment. But getting away from that, let's look at the Democrats. The Democrats. How about something a little bit more um, in your face, if you will? I mean, I doubt people are talking too much about the Green Party right now on the evening news. Eric Swalwell, the representative from the 15th District in California, is thinking about dropping out of the presidential election and wants to just retake his House seat. Exactly what we talked about. Doing this as a publicity stunt, trying to promote himself. And we still have new candidates coming in. Tom Steyer, Joe Sestick. Joe Sestick was the former representative from Pennsylvania. These guys are just coming into the race at odd times. 
Why? They seem to be getting name recognition on the national stage for, for about 12 hours, maybe. People on television and social media will be talking about you a little bit, and then you can have your little moment in the sun, and you're definitely going to remember some of these names if you see them up for election again, possibly cabinet positions, and it would help them out in, in their own political ambitions. Maybe if they're at the ballot box, you'll see that name versus an unknown so many times. You just have to wonder with the democratic process. Are people just voting for names that they vote for the name that they're familiar with, or sometimes people might even be voting for things that they, and they don't know who the candidates are? I remember being 18 years old and the first time I had a chance to vote, and it's like, well, I could vote for the incumbent governor because, I mean, I know who he is. How am I supposed to vote for the challenger when I have no idea who that person is at all? And it's like, unless you want to be a complete partisan and just go Democrat versus Republican, continuing onward with the same monotonous two-party system. That's why I was talking about libertarians and greens at the beginning, to really just sort of uh, begin things with some sort of, um, just something else. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I've been frustrated with the two-party system for a while. I've been talking about the third-party alliance, that the only way to overtake it is to unify all the independents, third parties, libertarians, greens, get everybody together, and create a sort of new third-party alliance that could win at least the popular vote or something like that, but we could, uh, that's kind of just uh, something for another election cycle, and let's just kind of leave it at that. What, it, what really happens, though, with conspiracy theories in the political sector? For example, we have things that, that are interlocking, right? That's how we introduced today's discussion. All right, interlocking means that there are world events that are connected to other things through a series of channels. You know, like a brick that is like on a wall or something. Not all the bricks are touching, but all of the bricks are part of the same wall, right? So this is like a major world event, and eventually, if you keep going up or you keep going down or to the left and to the right, you'll somehow see that you'll see the other thing, like September 11th, for example, that was connected to an enormous amount of world events. But it doesn't necessarily mean that these things are calculated. And it doesn't necessarily mean that these things are placed there deliberately. It also could be that there are just um, kind of coincidences, contradictions, unexplained events. You can't, it's like, oh, how did that one get there? How did that brick get broken? We don't really have an explanation for it, but it's still broken all the same. In the political world, the conspiracy theorists are very, very, they're very good at selling themselves. They talk about things like the New World Order and the globalists and, I mean, if you're the Lyndon LaRouche movement, the British system, a ways to tie in all that. But, I mean, what I've kind of gathered, though, said about the New World Order, it is an it, not a they. It's not exactly just a group of people. If you actually want to identify anything associated with that, I mean, I wouldn't even give a name to it. I would just say that the unfortunate consequences of our political system, that would be something like this New World Order, the unfortunate consequences of our political system. But what do we really have to make out of all of these things in terms of political conspiracies about the 2020 general election? The biggest conspiracy theory out there is that politicians don't believe what they say that they believe. Politicians aren't telling the truth. And we know that they're liars. I mean, politicians tell lies, okay? But it's a matter of determining what is true and what is false. Because us as the voters, us as in the general public, I'm a political outsider just like anybody else. You really want to know who is telling you the truth, who is not. Who is actually promoting a cause that is good to believe in, and who is just like making up some sort of con twisted and contrived emotional sequence that is just meant to manipulate people. I was having a conversation with somebody once about this, and they're just sort of like, they're kind of just like talking about how anytime you say something like that, they're just like, oh, that's just pure conspiracy talk. Absolutely not. Governments don't really promote falsehoods like that. But there's a very large school of thought that governments put out ideas into the general public 
through the media, through publications, by paying writers to compose certain material to try and sway the course of human thought, to try and get people to start thinking in a different way. And I don't exactly know enough about all of these things to say whether that is true or false. That'd be something that I would like to investigate more. What I can say is some of the types of, um, I guess you would say some of the information that has been presented. I mean, we have people like John Stockwell, former CIA, who's come forward in the 1980s saying that if you were to write a doctoral dissertation about the Vietnam War, it is most likely that at least 12 of your sources would be CIA plant materials where like, so they paid academics to falsify what happened in the Vietnam War. Apparently the CIA did that, someone went public about it. And then you also have things where the CIA was you know, promoting modern art. If you ever get a chance to listen to any of those things online about the CIA is promoting modern art as just a sort of a way to um, influence human thought. I mean, like it's some weird stuff, as well as even promoting liberal political writers in Africa. Why would the CIA do that? Well, they kind of created sort of a counterbalance to all of the sort of more right-wing authoritarian regimes that were just in place. So they started promoting left-wing political ideologies in, in Africa. And even the television show, Eight is Enough, was created by a CIA operative. It's based on the book that's written by a former CIA operative, Tom Braden, wrote the book, and then that turned into the television show. And he was actually the host of Crossfire in the 1980s. And, I mean, I saw some of those old episodes. We've talked about a few of the debates that they had on uh, Crossfire back in the 80s. And I was like, Tom Braden? Like, I mean, they said that he was, you know, the former CIA guy. like, they don't mean the host. The guy was sitting on Crossfire, also on the political left, mind you. But, yeah, they did. It's the same guy. So um, I can definitely say that there are connections to that. Once again, everything in life is interlocking. It does not mean that things are as uh, blown out of proportion as the conspiracy theorists want you to think it is. But you do see something that these people are trying to... By them, I mean like things like the CIA and organizations of that nature are trying to persuade human thought to come to a certain point. And I think it's one of the things that is highly underreported and definitely not taught in any sort of high school or college class. I mean, people really try to stay away from this entire concept of the government is putting out disinformation, disinfo agents. But when you're going to talk about someone else's government, why is that so acceptable? Propaganda. It is perfectly okay to say that the North Korean government is brainwashing its citizens. It is perfectly okay to say that the Soviet Union was spreading false information about what the other governments were doing. They're a propaganda machine and all that. It is perfectly acceptable to say that the Romanian dictator Ceausescu was lying to his people about what the government was really up to. When you're talking about someone else's government, you can say... Yeah, they lie to their citizens, and they put out genuinely misleading materials to pull together a certain sense of thought amongst the population. Why would the Americans, and the Canadians, and the British, and the Irish, and the Belgians be opposed to, to thinking in that way? Once people attain a certain sense of power... The rules go away. Rules are not for the people in charge. I mean, I was actually, back when we were following the Maura Murray case, we even brought up the quote from Fred Murray. Um, he was talking about the Roman senator Juvenal when he said, I mean, it's a line from Juvenal, but I was first introduced, introduced to it through this guy, Fred Murray, when he said, who is there to guard the guards themselves? When it's just like, who is watching the authority figures? And that's why I've said for a long time, there are not three branches of government, there are five branches of government, executive, legislative, judicial, number four is the CIA, and then the, the fifth one is the electorate, the voters. I mean, that is kind of like the um, built-in form of a balance of power, the system of checks and balances. The voters, the electorate, is a 
branch of power, a, a, a part of the checks and balances system. Because they're the ones who are supposed to be like, hey, you're a lousy politician. We're going to vote you out of office or something like that. Unless they're on the Supreme Court or something like that. I mean, what are you going to do about that one? Force resignation or something like that? Possibly. But the thing is, though, I do approach a lot of the material with a certain sense of skepticism when they try to say, you know, that these politicians are plotting and planning and scheming to try and destroy everybody, that this person hates humanity and that they're trying to just tear the earth apart because they're pure evil. And believe it or not, a lot of people say things like that. The eugenics conspiracies and a lot of the New World Order conspiracies are all about that, that just global elites are pure evil and they just want to destroy the earth. And that's actually probably going to be the subject of a very future upload. But what I would say is, governments can lie to you. And just because we're in the Western world, and just because we're in North America and Western Europe, as well as Australia and New Zealand and a handful of any other developed nation you'd like to look at, it does not mean that they aren't going to be putting out false and misleading materials to try and persuade human thought, to try and get people to start thinking in a different way. And we talked a lot about some of the people on the channel promote. On this channel, we've talked a lot about people who have promoted that, and we mentioned some things from the Lyndon LaRouche movement at the beginning, but I can't endorse anything that they have to say because they're so politically motivated. And that was something that the conspiracy theorist William Cooper even mentioned, that, like, once you sort of get politically motivated, that means you have an agenda. And it's like, where are just the truth tellers? I mean, like, once you sort of start picking sides, like, oh, you belong to a party, or you belong to this particular movement, you're taking sides, and you have an agenda. As opposed to somebody who is just um, trying to tell the truth. But some of the things, though, it's like, I mean, a lot of the famous writers... Are spon in British history are sponsored by the East India Company and things like that, paid to write things in a certain way. And also, I mean, some people become kind of the front, they become the face of propaganda of the British Empire, and they sort of attribute a lot of the things that this writer might have created to the single person. But in reality, they're just kind of like, they're just the face of it. They're just sort of like, what's the exact word, a shill or something? for the British Empire, the British royal family, and all that. I mean, we've had many royal families and many dynasties throughout the British Empire, of course. Just an example, pure, pure kind of like sketch artist example. Okay, to recap, people are using the presidency as a way to promote the, their own ideas. People are using the presidency as well as a way to just market themselves, gain publicity for their own things, it all comes back to the same sort of political dishonesty. There's somebody up there who's trying to act like they are different and that they really care about all these issues. How do you know the truth tellers versus the liars? I mean, we could just be so cynical to say that all of them are liars. I mean, like, all politicians are just fake and they're all cheaters. Even you, Marianne Williamson. No, 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 but um, I... She is probably one of the people who's more on her own. I mean, she's promoting stuff that she has had some form of consistency with. But you never know. The whole point is, you never really know. Okay, so, people sp can spread misleading information. People can be dishonest. And no one in the political system is immune to it. So why do we hold the governments of the North America and the whole Western world to act like they're some sort of superior force, that they aren't going to be spreading propaganda, that they aren't going to be spreading disinfo, that they aren't going to be lying to us, and that we aren't going to have things like the CIA putting out blatant misinformation through academic publications. We talked about how they can pay academics to write certain things, and then people will believe that and accept it as fact. We talked about how that they can pay artists and writers to create things in a certain way so people will start thinking in a certain way as in a response. And we also talked about writing books and creating things like television shows, once again, to have a certain cultural impact. Culture can be manipulated, data can be manipulated, information can be manipulated, and the populations can be misled. And there's no reason to think that whatever government you belong to, or whatever nation you belong to, rather, is immune from such practices. So let's approach this with a sense of skepticism. 
All right, well, that's all for now. A uh, little bit of a rant for today. And we're going to get into a new topic for tomorrow. We've got something new that we've never covered before on the channel. So stay tuned. Until next time.